Hello and welcome back and that is right it is time for data news of the week it's been about four or five months because we've been so wrapped up in new releases but I promised myself at the start of 2023 we would get right back into data news of the week and with CES 2023 up and running now is a perfect time to get back on the bandwagon so straight away let's talk news shall we so straight away when it comes to CES I'm not really going to focus on new cars bendy phone screens or new tellies i'm of course going to talk about data and storage and the biggest marketplace impact is of course Fizon uh, and a much more formal and much more realistic uh, reveal of the e26 controller their storage review they're going to feature a couple of times in today's uh, day news of the week uh, they've probably done the clearest coverage of the e26 although i will argue there is another icon i'm going to talk about which i think goes into probably the biggest depth but the nice easiest read through a lot of stuff going on and basically now Fizon have rolled out more formally the e26 controller you can see a lot more ssd brands start to reveal uh, their gen 5 ssds because they have kind of been waiting patiently um for the e26 from Fizon to kind of hit fruition now this controller the pcro gen 5 controller is the one that currently will uh, spit out somewhere between 10 and 13 uh, gigabytes per second but it's worth highlighting that this is still the first foray into Gen 5. Much like we saw with Gen 4, the first generation of Gen 4 SSDs were hitting five, five and a half thousand megs. And it wasn't until they really got to grips uh, with the bandwidth and getting some much more efficient controllers out there, along with improved NAND, that we started to see Gen 4 start hitting that six, seven thousand megs, almost fully saturating Gen 4 on the four times four lane. So with Gen 5, as impressive as this is, it's worth highlighting that this really is the beginning of when you're going to start to see um, that larger uh, bandwidth of 16 gigabytes start to get closer and closer. Now, there are some other reveals um, uh, with regards to uh, the X controller and the retimer, but moving slightly away from that, because we were talking last year about uh, that 26 controller there. If we have a look, this is uh, as far back as um, October 2021. That was the first real reveal of Fizon um, informally showing it. And even CES 2022, uh, we were talking about it. So this has been a long time coming for the Gen 5. And although Gen 5 was meant to formally roll out last year a lot more than it did, and lots of obviously delays from the pandemic, and of course, hardware shortages being a huge factor there, resulted in the delay of Gen 5. But if you head over to SSD Review or the SSD Review, they've done a full performance benchmark of this particular new Fizon controller from them. Now, again, as mentioned, it's going to be rolling out in lots of other brands. I'm sure Seagate will hop on as well because their close relationship with Fizon with a lot of their gen SSDs. But I strongly recommend checking out uh, this uh, SSD Review's testing of this because it shows a lot of that early gen of Gen 5 performance measures then. They've done the usual ones, they've done the Atto, um, ASSSD, Crystal Disk, that sort of thing. But the other thing uh, with the Gen 5 SSDs we touched on as kind of a theory, early doors, which is now proven to fruition, is cooling. Gen 5, if you thought Gen 4 was gonna get hot with those heat sinks, active cooling for M2 NVMe SSDs is going to be a much more realistic thing. Now, um, let's grab it there. Active cooling on M2 NVMEs is not new. We've seen a lot of SSDs or um, uh, heat sinks arriving uh, in the last year or so with heat sinks on board because, uh, not just heat sinks, sorry, active cooling fans on board because these SSDs are going to get so tr tremendously hot that not only is that detrimental to the NAND, but on top of that, it's simply going to make the SSD throttle itself and you won't get that higher end performance. So that's one of the contributing factors to why these first gen SSDs are going to be hitting, again, 10 to 12 to 13 gigabytes per second. And there's still three or four gigabytes to play with there in terms of bandwidth. But all of these SSDs that you're seeing rolling out with that E26 controller are all starting to arrive. This is uh, the HOF, the HOF from Galax. Um, this SSD, again, is going to have active cooling. And the ones that we've talked about, uh, the Kingston SSDs from last year, they've all got active cooling by default. So even if you do buy one of these SSDs without a heatsink, a standard heatsink is not going to make it. I think the days of your 5 to $10 heatsink are kind of numbered there. Um, 
In keeping on the subject of SSDs, we can talk about SK Hynix, another great uh, kind of prominent name in um, SSD components, uh, rolling out a lot of their new uh, kind of controllers, memory, NAND, um, and more importantly, the PS1010 there. This is going to be a much faster 2.5 inch equivalent that's going straight into uh, the Gen 5 slot there, whether that's via an adapter or uh, via a modified slot on a card. And we did see early testing once again on storage review there, showing off kind of from CES the performance benchmark that is possible. But this isn't a new story. This SSD has been around for a little while. But one of the other things that's rolling is this idea of using 4D NAND rather than the 3D NAND. Now, 4D NAND, it's not quite the same as 3D. It's about the movement of components on board. And there's, again, a great markup uh, right up here on All About Circuits, which kind of breaks down in a nice, easy, chewable way the difference between 3D and 4D NAND. And the fact that it's kind of already existed from other proprietary sources prior to this under different names. But still, nonetheless, it is freeing up space on the controller and being more power efficient. And ultimately, when it comes to uh, storage at the CES event, this was kind of the big takeaway there. But again, let's move on to some other CES releases. Aside from SSDs, the only other area that got any kind of big focus in terms of data storage and, te uh, and network technology at CES was the subject of Thunderbolt 4 docks. Now, for those that haven't been following it, Thunderbolt, much like PCI Gen 5 SSDs in 2022, kind of had to take a few steps back hardware shortages, pandemic, etc, etc. And ha um, hardware components in Thunderbolt technology, both 3 and 4, are kind of being thrown to the sidelines. And although there is talk of Thunderbolt 5 at the moment, I'm not really going to talk about it there because at the moment, Thunderbolt 4 is still catching up. Indeed, USB 4 devices have sort of overtaken it in terms of commercial availability with more and more laptops arriving quite affordably with the um, USB 4 port on board. In fact, we got a couple of Arico devices being reviewed this month that are Thunderbolt 4 compliant that should really spike your interest. But... When it comes to um, Thunderbolt devices, probably the standout devices were docking stations. And the OWC Thunderbolt 4 dock, the Go, is much like most of the other docking stations on the market, but it's got a couple of very interesting um, inclusions on it, one of them bigger than the other. Now, again, unless you use a docking station yourself, like you're a content creator, photo video editor, post production, you probably won't understand the significance of what makes a, uh, the uh, OWC Go Thunderbolt dock that exciting. Indeed, they already revealed uh, a preview video over on their YouTube channel towards the end of last year. And it is this. It is that internal PSU. Now, most docking stations, when you get them, particularly Thunderbolt ones, they need some serious power to keep things running not only because thunderbolt itself is quite demanding even though you're connecting it to a thunderbolt device but all the additional ports like two thunderbolt port dots generally uh ports on a dock and particularly thunderbolt 4 but alongside that all the other ports and ma maintaining that bandwidth requires a lot of power and no one that's ever used an editing machine that has a thunderbolt port with a thunderbolt drive connected will know that they just draws a lot of power from your system now that means that most Thunderbolt 3 and Thunderbolt 4 docks have enormously awkward, annoying PSUs. External power bricks bigger than that of laptops. So it doesn't make them portable. And that's what stands out with the Go. Because the Go is arriving with an internal PSU. And that doesn't sound like much. But if you are a Thunderbolt dock user, you will know the pain of carrying a power brick that is heavier than the device itself. But also, as you just saw there on screen, there is... The fact that it has a 2.5 gigabit Ethernet port there, so you can directly interface with a NAS or a 2.5G network to, you know, edit over that network or just transfer files two and a half times faster than that of standard gigabit Ethernet. And there are, of course, USB 3.2 Gen 2 ports on there for 10 gigabits per second and even HDMI 2.1 on there. So great performance and great bandwidth utilization with that internal PSU. But that's not the only docking station. Pluggable introduced their new P, um, uh, uh, Thunderbolt dock there. This is their, again, Thunderbolt 4 dock. This, again, will have an external power brick, unfortunately, but it does allow a lot more of those ports we just talked about there. Again, 2.5G, 10G uh, USB. It is a great little dock, and it will probably be a little bit more affordable than the OWC because it having a more standard uh, PSU interface there. And again, 
Other docking stations were revealed, but a lot of these were more traditional slot-in hub docks. And again, Thunderbolt 4 technology. At the moment, I'm not saying they're tapping the brakes a little bit, but due, due to the hardware shortages on those components, look at the QNAPs that we've talked about before. A lot of those Thunderbolt 4 solutions, the 4644, um, maybe a Thunderbolt alternative to the 74 series, We've not seen those yet, or maybe at all. Um, it's been more than a year since the talk of the 464T4, so hopefully that has not become vaporware. The only other thing that was covered at CES in terms of storage was Kingston's new Iron Key, a USB-C encrypted drive, military-grade encryption. And again, they've had a few of these out there in the past, and I know it's not that exciting, but for portable data between places in your pocket, it's actually quite handy there. And of course, because it's taking advantage of USB 3.2 Gen 2, you're going to get those higher enhanced speeds there. But that's really enough for storage and networking at CES. Let's get to grips with some good old-fashioned data news of the week and talk about some of the highs and lows, and frankly, some of the weird that's been happening in data storage for the last few weeks. First up, a new product alert there, and I say new product, it's one that we have been talking about here on the channel for the better part of three months, and that is the DS723 seems to be on the cusp of release there. We're seeing that, and again, we've already got um, some information on this already in process, and if you have a look, the DS723 has appeared on numerous Chinese and Japanese websites in the last week or so, with lots of uh, confirmed information about the hardware spec. Of course, we've known a lot about that spec. To throw back that reference, there was that Reddit post, which unfortunately the user is gone now. Uh, they were the first to kind of crack the story on the DS723 specs arriving online, and again, although we've known about it for a while, it was really weird that we knew about the DS723 before most other devices, although there is a value series device being talked about with the RTD 1619 processor. But the 723 was the first device to kind of be revealed of that new Gen 2023 Plus series. But then since then, the 923 Plus was leaked, revealed, and released in that time. But it does look like this device is on the cusp of being released. Indeed, if you head over to Facebook and of course, uh, our friends over on Black Void, it looks like their review is going to be up exceptionally soon. And again, I do recommend you check out their site to find out more on that. Uh, good old Luca over there, we had him on the channel to talk about some of the DSM 7.2 stuff there. But at the moment, it hasn't become live on any Synology sites yet, even though uh, over in the East, the Taiwanese site and the Chinese site and the Japanese site have yet to add the 723 on there at the moment. But again, the 723, the, uh, the two uh, bay alternative to the 923 plus, optional 10 GBE on there, M2 MV and Me slots that are gonna be used for storage pools inside there. And although it's only got two gig of memory, it can still be upgraded over two slots to 32 gig there. And of course, once we've got one here in the studio, we're doing lots of tests there for you. And again, Synology will be appearing later again um, in this video, but for less good news, we'll get to that later on. Next up, ransomware, of course, and another annoying attack that hit one of the bigger names here in the UK, and that is the Guardian newspaper. Frankly, one that kind of gets quite close to where I live, simply because there isn't a lot of media platforms that I do read on a regular basis, but Private Eye and The Guardian are still very much on my radar. And unfortunately, this attack, which took place uh, just before Christmas, um, hitting their offices, forcing a lot of the staff uh, to be requested by the um, Guardian higher-ups to work from home. And this is still kind of being unpicked. The exact details of what has been hit and whether this is just um, uh, a damage of infrastructure rather than any kind of data um, hiding, because they will have backups in place, of course. But the extent of which uh, to what this attack has done has yet to be fully explored. They did report uh, the attack as they are, you know, under guidelines supposed to do. I believe it's 72 hours. I might be wrong. Um, but again, this is something that happened before Christmas, but it's continuing to roll out. There has been a story over on the register going into a little bit more detail about this, how statements have now been issued on this. St uh, staff globally are being asked where possible to work from home, obviously, because of the pandemic. That's something people can do. They were doing that a lot uh, earlier on in 2020 and 2021. So that infrastructure, at least for the staff and the work, what place practice is there. But we're still waiting to see how much of the operations have been affected and how much slowly is being retrieved globally. Because, they, again, a multi-site deployment like that, they're going to have a lot in place. But, again, this isn't the first time we, uh, ransomware has been something of a hot news topic. And, of course, the issues recently with Lockbit, with them at uh, a couple of targets that were hit for um, ransomware 
and obviously trying to make a bunch from those. Um, again, this one was kind of reported in a few different places where one of the places they hit was a hospital for as uh, sick kids, um, and and they kind of gave the decrypt. They didn't take any money from them. Which again, whether this is a you know kind of them having morals or anything like that, it's hard to say. But again, it has been widely reported in a few places. Only on a couple of website. Uh, websites was it reported that uh, Lockbit actually issued a statement on this saying the individual that had performed this attack uh, violated their own rules and was blocked from future activity by the organization again how much sympathy you can have I don't know because we are still talking about ransomware which is pretty shitty um, but for now that's enough about ransomware horrible horrible stuff let's carry on with some goodish news and over to TerraMaster, we can talk a lot about kind of the flurry of activity that's been happening there over the last six to eight weeks. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the release of the TOS 5.1 beta that's bringing a lot of improvements. You can find out a lot more on the official pages in the forum, but we're talking about improvements in the driver for 4K transcoding, the uh, decoder there. So if you are going to use 4K transcoding on a new gen, um, that's with the N5105. Uh, Plex, you know, uh, Plex app on a TerraMaster NAS, 4K transcoding will be vastly improved, HEVC and stuff like that. Also improvements in the Linux kernel, as well as the utilization of increasing your storage pools onto connected USB storage drives, although they, of course, are recommending their own USB DAS expansion device there. But they do have that fluid uh, T-RAID expansion there, improvements in the caching, improvements in the Docker, improvements in the AI being utilized from within uh, the TerraPhotos AI photo recognition tool there lots of improvements in the background although i will highlight that they have taken this surveillance app offline temporarily to make some adjustments and improvements now i talk about the flurry of activity is also worth highlighting that one of their offices was hit um by um particularly vi virulent um, spreading of covid in one of their offices and surprisingly unlike a lot of organizations that try to kind of hide that fact I'm kind of refreshed by the honesty that they actually issued a statement on their forums saying that at, during this time there will be slight delays in responses due to this key area of their tech um, and support area having people either completely out of commission or working from home. So it was kind of weird to see them actually highlighting that on their forum and I sort of respect it that they were talking about it. Um, on top of that there is four new releases to talk about there that have been kind of popped up over the last month and a half. Firstly, a two port 10 GBE quad core nine bay. This is an SFP connected um, device here with a couple of 2.5 GBE ports as well, powered by a quad core, quad core Intel Atom processor, the c 358 um, um, and that is a CPU you are going to see appearing a lot more in 2023, if you know what I mean. Get ready to see that CPU appearing a lot if uh, from not just TerraMaster, but other brands as well. On top of that, there was a new rack station they revealed there. Again, this is, again, utilizing a new value series um, using um, an ARM V8.2 processor there. Very important um, because, again, you're going to start to see... Uh, that value processor appearing in the new 2-bay, the new 4-bay, new rack mounts. And this is alongside, of course, uh, new Synology, new QNAPs. This is going to be the new darling uh, value processor. You're going to see more and more. And I'm serious when we are talking about a new two, two, um, DS223, a new DS423, a new uh, J-series. This is the CPU you're going to start to see appearing more and more. Last up, we can talk about that Synology vulnerability that I highlighted earlier on and in Synology's SRM platform and with VPN Plus, uh, vulnerability was discovered and patched, but the severity of that particular vulnerability was rated 10 out of 10 by Synology, a low difficulty, high impact vulnerability there. The two worst things you want to hear about vulnerability. But one thing I will highlight that the majority of people covering this with the exception of bleeping computer didn't really present this right. Bleeping Computer played a very straight line here because this vulnerability along with another one, the SA2223 vulnerability, are ones that were either discovered by Synology themselves on their security team or via funded security bounty events. Now, this is very different to a vulnerability that people should be worried about 
or that people have exploited because this is one that Synology themselves have found or via a sponsored event or a sponsored platform for people to volunteer vulnerabilities so they can work on them and not only present the vulnerability but the solution largely together. They didn't have to publish it. They didn't have to talk loud about it. They could have just kept quiet and they didn't. So again, Fair play to Synology for that, and fair play to Believe in Computer to being one of the platforms covering this story, actually being a lot more um, clear about Synology's involvement in this vulnerability and how it was presented and found. Because this isn't like uh, when Deadbolt happened and stuff like that. This is very much them going, we found a vulnerability, we fixed the vulnerability, we just want you to know that it existed and it is being worked on. So to put that into perspective, if you go through Synology's pages there, you can find the VPN Plus server vulnerability as found by Synology's own PSIRT um, team there. Then you've got the 2225 SRM one that we talked about there. And again, this comes from these different individual users looking for credit and, of course, a little bit of bunts. Thanks to, of course, Pwn to Own, something we could have talked about if we'd been doing Data News of the Week in the last two or three months. And if that Pwn to Own is an event over in Toronto where you get lots of hackers trying to show lots of vulnerabilities that they have found or at least test uh, proof of concept or actually executing and you get points for it and depending on the severity depending on the level of it day zero day one etc they get a certain amount of points to all, all are fighting for the big prize with this chap here this hacker who earned just shy of a million dollars at the event showing off a series of different day zero and day one patches again adding up all of that score to get those together to get that money of course one of them was a Synology vulnerability there which is Synology of course have chipped in Synology have then resolved it and this is why it's really really important to have these bounty programs because people are gonna search for holes so better that the brands themselves monetize this so they can make solutions and repara uh, not reparations to resolve these issues rather than these individuals taking this knowledge this know-how and then trying to expunge you the end user so i've always championed synology's bounty program there and recently i believe it was towards the end of last year qnap finally rolled out their own bounty program which i think is long 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 overdue but again this has been the return of data news of the week while we don't have any high profile releases um we will continue to do this but obviously if some big stream of new releases come out we try to do this every week but other than that we don't monetize the news video this is completely unmonetized all the links to today's content and all the articles we've looked at are linked in the description but apart from that have yourself a great weekend and a great start to 2023 i'll see you next time